Welcome back, everybody. Happy Friday. I am back from New York, quite literally came home, got on my car, drove home, dropped my suitcases and came down here to start recording this podcast because there's so much to talk about. I And I, I'm amped to talk about it. I wrote up all the show notes on the plane. And uh, yeah, let's just dive in because Microsoft had a massive week, a massive week of new hardware, new products, new OSs, and some things you can't even buy uh, get announced in New York City. And so we're going to kick it off here with some of the mundane, but we're going to work our way and weave our way through this complex announcement and things coming out of Camp Redmond. So first off, we've got the new Surface Book 13-inch comes with the Intel 10 nanometer, which is a 10th generation quad-core chip, kicking it off at a thousand bucks, USB Type-C, but the more lucrative or uh, you know exciting thing being announced here actually was the Surface Book 15-inch AMD option, which is going to come with a Ryzen 5 uh, Ryzen 5 or up to a Ryzen 7 mobile processor and Radia Vega 9 or Vega uh, 11 graphics, depending on what you want to do with it, uh, or, or I should say depending on how much you want to spend, and then you can obviously get the better graphics on the AMD side. Now, interestingly enough about this, the AMD version is consumer only. If you want a 15-inch Surface Laptop 3 with an Intel chip, you potentially can't get it, but if you have a corporate channel supplier, then you can get it for reasons that don't make a lot of sense. I'm sure there was some finagling back on Intel side that says, hey, you got to at least offer ours. And they said, okay, we'll do AMD in the consumer channel, and then we'll do Intel in the corporate channel. So there is a 15-inch Surface laptop with Iris graphics and a core i5 and i7 option, but it's only for commercial SKUs. Now, on back, jumping back to the AMD one, because that one's the, a little bit more interesting. I was able to dig up. A, a question came in says, hey, what is the Zen platform? Is it Zen 1, 2, 3, or where is it? Um, well, it's definitely not Zen 1. So what Microsoft is saying is that their custom chip, which, you know, put custom, and they call this the Ryzen Surface Edition. It's they didn't tweak a whole lot here, but anyways, it is what they are calling a Zen 2 Plus. So it's better than Zen 2, but it is not a mobile Ryzen Zen 3 platform at this time. So it is, you can kind of think of it, well, it's a Zen 2 Plus. They did a little bit of extra configuration, slapped the Microsoft Surface name on it, which that was sort of a theme of Microsoft wanting to come out talking about making their own chips, even though they were really just partnering with other chip companies and then slapping their branding and naming on them. But anyways, those are out. Um, Intel versions of both their 13 and 15 inch get up to 16 gigs of RAM. Here's the killer though, on the AMD option, you can nab up to 32 gigs of RAM. You can, a 32 gigs of RAM on that, on a, on a Vega 11 uh, 15 inch device, that, that is a, a pretty decent little mobile machine. I mean, yes, it's not the be all end all for gaming solutions on the road or development machines, but it's not slouching. It is not slouching in any capacity there. So that's, you know, it's another option if you're not gonna be buying one of these Surface books, which we'll talk about later, my friends. We will talk about that later um, because that 15 inch could fill a nice gap. Now, the battery life for both the Intel and the AMD versions are saying 11 and a half hours. You're not going to get 11 and a half hours. I've done enough Surface reviews over my past 10 years, um, even though Surface hasn't been around for 10 years. I've done enough Surface hardware review from day one to know that when they quote 11 and a half hours, you're not getting that under like some perfect scenario. You are going to get I am betting somewhere between seven and eight hours out of real world usage. Um, their 11 hours is usually some kind of mix and match. With it, it never comes out to what they actually claim. It is always less. Microsoft is not alone in that. I'm not trying to like say that Microsoft lies when they're doing this, but um, they are always they are always lower than anything else uh, or what they what they state. Unless you just quite literally open up a video, turn the brightness down, turn the volume down, and then just let it run a video for 11 hours. Like it's you're not going to get that in real world. So just keep that in mind. Now overall opinions, I got to touch both of these devices. I very much like that 15 inch. I took a 15 inch laptop by the way to Surface. Uh, to the Surface event in New York City because that is my mobile editing rig. So I like that style. I I, I, I liked it. Um, I, it's very nice without the carpet on it. I, it feels 
it, it feels like a MacBook Pro without the stupid touch bar and with mechanical keys or a keyboard that works. If you guys didn't catch it, you need to go watch some of the promo videos because some of the first things, the first things in the promo reels are the mechanical key switches. I mean, that is a straight shot at the heart of Apple's butterfly buffoonery that has been going on where they have been struggling to get a keyboard that isn't susceptible to dust. Now, obviously, if something goes wrong here and Microsoft screws this up, it'll be a big slap in the face. That being said, Microsoft is pretty confident in these and they're great machines. I really like them. Um, I, I much prefer without the carpet on it, the Al Alcantara. I know it's not carpet, but I much prefer that those models. So if I was going to recommend one, get one without it because it just feels like a very nice, very well machined and they're good, they're good laptops. Now they do come with USB type C. There's no Thunderbolt. There's no Thunderbolt on any of this stuff. Um, I will say that the one thing that is on all of this stuff is Microsoft is introducing fast charging. So up to 80% recharge in an hour across all surface devices. That is actually a pretty dang good feature. So uh, you can get, you know, charged up on the go pretty quickly, as long as you have the right chargers and everything with you. If you're, if you have multiple surface chargers in your house, you got to make sure that everything is, is all lined up and you get the right stuff connected, but up to 80% in one hour. That is not bad. Not bad. And then the other hardware, which this one was the most boring and the Surface Pro 7. All they did was they took the display port out and put in a USB-C and then that was it. They updated the chips uh, to the same uh, Intel 10 nanometer as they've done on everything else. It does start at a nice price point though of 749. So if you have an existing, I don't have one, the full size, this is a Surface Go, but if you have an existing type cover, it will work with that generation. And then you'll be able to get into that hardware for 749, which is not a bad price for an upgrade. I don't think I would upgrade from a Pro 6, but if you have a Pro 5 or a Pro 4, that could very well be a good tantalizing option uh, to keep that heritage alive live although i will tell you because next to the surface pro 7 is the surface pro x surface pro x that that was the device that i was most interested in going into this until they announced the other stuff um, but the surface pro x I, I got a lot of hands on time with this thing um, it the the problem with the surface pro x is that it makes the surface pro 7 look like crap that is, that is the biggest problem. You look at these things side by side, and even though the Surface Pro 7 is more capable, has, has more power, um, has the Intel chip, and is the Surface Pro we know and love, you look at that Surface Pro X and you're like, that, that looks pretty dang good. Like, it really does look great. Um, I've done some hands-on videos and all that stuff, but I spent some time with it, and I gotta tell you, the, the performance seems okay it's going to be tough to do it and i got my hand slapped a couple times trying to download benchmarking applications they don't want you doing that yet although they can't do that forever because these things come out um, next month but it has a custom arm chip developed with microsoft and qualcomm called the sq1 now they wouldn't say what sq1 was but it pretty much seems like surface qualcomm one uh, would be a very logical name for the chip. Now, they also wouldn't confirm or deny, for that matter, that the Excalibur codename was the SOC for this. We don't really know, um, but I have a bunch of data on the SOC, that SOC, so maybe I can try to figure that out. But what we did learn is that the one, one of the big hallmarks of an ARM device, like the Surface Pro X, the, the reason why Microsoft and everybody else has been pitching this thing is battery life. Battery life, that's why you go, why do you go ARM? Well, you get LTE out of the box and you get really dang good battery life. Uh, it's not happening here. Well, you are getting LTE out of the box. You're only getting 13 hours of battery life. 13 feels low. I was expecting 17 to 20 because that's what we've been hearing on other style devices. And 13 hours, I don't care what Microsoft says. One, you're not gonna get 13 hours. You already had the discussion. I'm betting it's somewhere between like eight to 10 maybe, I probably eight or nine in real world. And that is not all day battery life. All day battery life is 24 hours. If you went to marketing BS, it should at least be 12 hours. And that 13 mark, you are not going to get um, using real world applications. Now, the reason, the question is, why might be the battery life be so low? Here is my, my slightly educated opinion because I asked this question to the engineer who was designing the chip. And we, we, we I asked him, I said, hey, are you getting less battery life because you had to clock up the SOC to make the Windows performance better? And the answer was yes. And so that's the trade-off. They could clock down that chip, but then the Windows application performance would not be as great. And so keep in mind, the Surface Pro X 
can run 32-bit applications, your standard run-of-the-mill 32-bit applications. Now, it cannot run 64-bit applications. So for most people, for most people, that's not going to be a problem. There are outlying scenarios, I'm fully aware of them, where that is not gonna be good. You're also on that Surface Pro X, you're not gonna be running, you're not, you don't wanna run Photoshop. Um, I mean, you can, but you, it's not, it's not going to be great. You don't want to be doing video editing. Don't try to render your 4K stuff. Although I probably will because I'm dumb. Um, it's not a workhorse machine. This is a, think of it as a, a souped up Surface Go that you can take out into the world, have LTE connectivity. It's LTE advanced connectivity, by the way. And have pretty good battery life. Take your photos of whatever you're doing in a like first line, first worker experience and be good. It, um, what do they call it? They say it has a 13-inch display and a 12-inch chassis. I just, I just, it hurts to say that, um, but it looks like a good machine. Oh, they also said it has a two teraflop GPU engine in there. But you know, again, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, multiple USB Type C ports, a new type cover with a spot for the pen for the pen, which has been redesigned. It looks like a carpenter pencil. It docks into the Surface Type cover. You can close it up, and you don't have to worry as much about it as when it was just stuck with magnets. Uh, the pen felt great, I used it for a little, little bit. And using the Surface Pro X, if you haven't checked out the hands-on video, you know, go do that now. But using the Pro X, it, it felt fine. We opened up um, some basic productivity apps and, and a browser and we tried to open up as many as we could and Alt-Tab and do timeline and all that stuff. And it, it was fine, but I, I don't want to say that this is the hallmark, okay, we're done, like we don't need to, like that was, in a canned environment, we couldn't really stress it. Um, we didn't know what effects those were having to the battery life either. But and very first, very on initial early impressions of the Pro X, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. I, I really am. Uh, I wish the battery life was honestly about twice what it is, and then it would be like, whoa, that would be a, a killer machine. But the Pro X, the, the thinner bezels, the USB Type-C, this is what a modern Windows machine should look like, and it, it's really exciting. I wish that we were a little bit further down the, the pipeline of revisions at this point, but we here's where we are, and that is the one that is the one that has me most interested because there's a lot of scenarios where that, like like when I think of uh, candidly, like thinking my daughter has an iPad. What a Surface Pro is not really comparable to an iPad um, for multiple reasons: one size, thickness, blah blah blah. Um, the Pro X. I, yeah, like I would put it closer to that camp because it's got that same thinness. It's, it's fanless. Uh, it's got, it's got a lot going for it. I just hope that the performance and capabilities work out as best as we can. Oh, the other thing that I have been lacking, um, a lot of these devices now are serviceable. Um, meaning you can replace the hard drives in the new, in the new hardware that Microsoft has announced with a major qualification if you're a qualified technician. So basically what they've done is rather than having to rip the carpet off, off of like say the Surface laptop, there's now screws on the bottom which have a custom screw bit uh, and then you can take it off and now you get behind the battery and then you can swap out the hard drive. I asked what it takes to become a technician and they wouldn't tell me, but I'm betting that companies like iFixit are gonna have a real quick uh, look at this and be able to figure out how to do it. I think the biggest challenge candidly is probably just trying to figure out how to get the adapter to take those screws out. That is gonna be it. That is a big, and I don't want to underscore that, for the enterprise customers, the serviceability of this hardware is a big deal because they invest a lot in it. And obviously hard drives are typically one of the first things to go after the warranty expires. So if you have a warranty for a year and then the hard drive craps out, you don't wanna buy a whole new thing. And up until now being able to service that really was not possible. Microsoft has made a very good design decision and they're putting function over form to allow those things to be serviceable. And I commend Microsoft very much for doing that. And then the big thing here, no Thunderbolt across anything. I asked Microsoft and they, they just waffle about a bit and they say, hey, Surface Connect works really well. We're amping it up, right? You've got the quick charging now. All of our customers want board, boards, forwards and backwards capability, um, blah, blah, blah. They're not doing it. What the real answer is, I believe they're waiting until USB Type 4 when, when Thunderbolt will be built in natively. It'll be built in nat natively and that is when it will come to the entire generation. We will get to the Neo and the Duo in a second, but at first I want to talk about something I scooped up along with the AMD stuff and some other things, whatever, uh, are the earbuds, the Project Morrison that, that Panos and company 
pulled out of, well, a box, honestly, because that's where they live. They live in a little box. Um, so the Surface earbuds, $249.99, folks. That is, I have a lot of opinions, some good, some bad. This one is more on the, hey, hey okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll see here. Uh, $249. Now, Here's where the questions become in. Well, we'll get there first. Um, so they have the, the large touch discs, right? I actually got to try these things on and it's basically just a touch pad, right? It, it supports gestures, forward, back, uh, volume up, volume down. It integrates with Office, which is interesting. For example, if you're using PowerPoint, you can slide your finger forward on that little disc and it will advance the slide. It, interesting and it's also got some other office 365 integrations um, it also can do real-time voice translation meaning if somebody's speaking a different language they will translate and then obviously you get the language um, locally which is a big deal don't get me wrong but they're not that's not exclusive to what microsoft is doing and then they also have the ability to create captions right they hear something and then they can put up on your screen a caption of what people are saying around you um, which is i believe potentially a microsoft um, exclusive feature on this so there are some cool things about this and they fit in my ear pretty well although you they feel awkward like just because you know what they are they're they're discs that sit in here it's almost like a star trek looking thing will i am is apparently pissed off because apparently he had earbuds that were looking like this anyways that is aside from the point my question here is where is microsoft going to market these things because let's think about this if they're truly marketing them as just earbuds as just they go in your ear you get some music and i can't comment on the sound quality because it was very loud uh where we were testing these things and i only got maybe 10 15 minutes with it and trying to get everything perfect and the eq settings it wasn't there but they sounded fine for the scenario but if they are truly targeting just like the audio portion I don't know why somebody would buy these over AirPods, which are m less expensive, or the Samsung Galaxy Buds, or any of, any of the other ones. So I don't, they're overpriced for that market. Now, if Microsoft is trying to pitch these as a productivity peripheral, that's an interesting approach, right? You pitch them to the office worker, be like, hey, you're doing a presentation, go like this to advance your slide, rather than clicking. That That is an, an option. Um, there's other functionality built into Office or well, or is coming soon. And so that is another approach that Microsoft could pitch these things. But then the question becomes is, do people really wanna be advancing PowerPoint slides with their ear? That I don't know. There, in, But in the corporate market, they could pitch them at a higher price point of 249 and potentially be more successful. So this is the question that I haven't heard or clearly answered from Microsoft is how are they pitching them? Are they pitching them as, as musical things that can also do office stuff? Or are they pitching them as office stuff that can also do musical things? Like I don't see myself wearing those to the gym, for example. Um, but if you want to wear them in the office, maybe that makes sense. We will see, we will see. Um, I talked to Ralph or Rolf uh, Groen, uh about them actually. He said they took about three years to make and he used to wear them riding into work on his bike. And um, you know, that's how they kind of, they built them in the real world. And so he was, uh, he, he loved them, he loved them. So, okay. First big item of the day, ladies and gentlemen, Centaurus, or what we now know as Surface Neo. Surface Neo, this was, we, we expected this. I mean, I think we heard that there was something big coming, and so we kind of assumed it was Centaurus. And so Centaurus is Microsoft's first shown off foldable, a foldable device, but not a foldable display. Big difference there, big difference there. And it's what I think is more aligned to the future of Windows. There's a big software component to this that it overshadows, in my opinion, everything else. With this device, Microsoft has figured out how to containerize the Win32 API to basically sandbox those applications or containerize them. That is a huge deal, guys. That don't under, don't, that, if Microsoft can nail that functionality, which it seems they are confident they are doing, this will fundamentally change the longevity of Windows and it can honestly turn it into something like a Chromebook where you have that instant on capability where Win32 apps cannot muck up the rest of the, the Windows install. Um, what this feature is basically allows them to do is to build Windows RT or Windows 10S that they tried to twice where they failed because they didn't have this technology. So 
if they've got it right, this is a very big deal. Um, and it also comes with a new version of Windows. And this is some confusing stuff, and this is classic Microsoft. It runs Windows 10X. Now, Surface Pro X, which we talked about earlier, does not run Windows 10X. Windows 10X is a new SKU of Windows designed explicitly for this foldable type device, which there are other foldable devices coming. Uh, they, they told us that other OEMs are working on them. And they will run this Windows 10X that supports this, this virtualization or sandboxing, I should say, of the Win32 API, um, the drag and drop, you know, split screen type mentality. Everything that you saw in the, the demonstrations is part of Windows 10X. It works with pen input. Um, yeah, it, it's it's interesting. It, it's an interesting device. So I, I actually talked to Chris Capicella, who is the CMO at um, uh, at Microsoft about this thing. And he, he was asking my opinion. I said, Chris, here here is my take on this. Obviously, having not been able to use it yet, right? This is me asking questions about thinking about how it's going to fit into the market. I said, Chris, here's here's the question. This device is too big. It's not going to be a phone. We I think we can agree with that. It's probably, there's not really a tablet side of the Windows world yet, and maybe that will change with this. So in my opinion, Centaurus needs to replace, is going to replace a laptop. I don't think people are going to buy a Centaurus, or sorry, I keep calling it that, a Neo, and replace their desktop. I think they would buy a Neo and replace their laptop. That is my kind of personal opinion right now. So to me, I need Microsoft to demonstrate how the Neo is more productive in a better device than a laptop. And that is a very high barrier, a very high barrier to cross. I'm not saying they can't do it. I'm not saying they won't do it. And I'm not saying they will do it. But that to me is the benchmark. The benchmark for me is, is this device better than a standalone laptop? That is the question that Microsoft needs to answer and prove in the year ahead for this device to be successful. And if they can do it in a compelling way, that'll be super interesting. Of course, that puts aside price point. I fully expect this device to be premium. Um, it, it's not going to be something that everyone's going to mass adopt from day one. But it is the future because it has a, an updated UI, which if you've looked at any of my stuff that I had posted or leaked earlier about Windows Lite, it looked very similar. It is in that same family of style. That style, as of right now, is not coming to Windows 10. Microsoft told us they said it's staying with that because they feel like they have a pretty good UI on Windows 10. And I'm not going to argue against them, but they feel like for that form factor... What they are creating is working a little bit better, but I can guarantee you folks, if people really truly love that UI, they'll make it available for Windows 10. It's still Windows 10, it's just you know, a different shell at a different location. Super interesting device. I am most interested in the Centaurus device um, because they also have another device, which we all know, and this was the kind of like, whoa, and it's a good thing on last podcast, I, somebody asked me if I'd eat a hat if they announced a phone. It's a good thing I didn't say yes, but I didn't think they would announce a phone. But they did. And so I had some information like they were going to announce this. But I, if somebody came to you and said, hey, Microsoft's going to announce an Android phone at this event. And it's not going to be available for more than a year. It doesn't make sense. But here we are. Um, so Microsoft announced Surface Duo, which is Andromeda or a derivative of Andromeda. Easily the biggest surprise because it doesn't run Windows. It runs Android. It's an Android phone. Microsoft said they built it in conjunction with Google. But, but I mean, they're just partners. They probably downloaded this stuff and got it up and running. Um, I do think that running the, this device, because it is phone style, running Android makes a lot more sense than Windows. They don't have to worry about apps. They just need to worry about the hardware. It's an interesting play. I'm... I'm still have a lot of weird feelings about this device. Let me explain. So this is a phone. Microsoft is calling it a, well, I don't know if they're calling it a phone, but it's definitely a phone. Um, they showed off phone functionality and it folds shut. So here's, here's Brad's, you know, 50 cent concerned relationship about this device. One, it is more than a year away. So what we've seen today may change between now and then. There are a lot of very, very, very good phone makers out there. So they are going up against companies like Apple, Samsung, uh, Huawei, um, OnePlus, um, Google's with the, the Pixel line. There are, they're now competing against that. And I do think that the Duo is honestly going to be very much a niche device. I'm, I'm not thinking this is, again, going to be a mass market thing. There's going to be people who want it. Um, it also was a very killer xCloud demo, by the way. But here's my biggest kind of challenge with this device. There, there needed to be an outer screen. So the device naturally rests folded closed like a book. Well, if you pull that thing out of your pocket and you have a notification, 
you can't access it until you open the device, which is not exactly optimal. So, okay, you, you, you get past that and maybe, maybe that's fine. Um, the other thing that has me concerned about this are cameras, right? Microsoft hasn't really been known for building high quality cameras. They, they divested a lot of that Nokia stuff. Maybe they still have some Nokia patents, we don't know. But on a smartphone, what is everybody gunning for these days? Cameras. And so is Microsoft going to be able to compete on the camera front for this device? Because again, if they come out with a device that you can't see, but maybe it has the best in, best in class camera, you can overlook that. Or you can overlook the, the functionality you get by opening it up. It's an interesting device and I don't want to come off as super negative. These are just the things that I'd like to see Microsoft address. Because again, this device along with the Neo is not coming. It's not coming for a year and for a year, maybe even a little bit more than a year, because they said holiday 2020. So they're going to be teasing this stuff. They're going to be talking about it. I'm happy that they have it out in the open. It's going to be real interesting to see how these two devices continue to adopt and evolve to all of the complexities that have been announced. And as people look at it, because again, it's not a foldable display. It's a foldable phone. All it is is two displays hinged together. Microsoft loves their hinges. They built another product that does a hinge thing. Um, I, I'm not knocking it. That's just the reality of it. And so now they need to prove that Duo running Andromeda, which that is a little interesting to me that they have to wait a year for that because they're not really building the OS too much uh, and, and dual screened things have already existed. So I don't know why we have to wait a year for the Duo. I understand the Neo. I, I totally get that because it's Windows. That Yeah, we, we get all that. Anyways, the Duo will be interesting. Price point is going to be high, I bet. It's not going to be entry level. Is $1,000 reasonable for that thing? Would you pay $1,000 for it? I, it? It's an interesting device, and Microsoft is pushing boundaries again. I, the, the one takeaway I get out of this whole event, regardless of the, the devices announced, everything else, Microsoft just kind of went crazy, right? They, they pushed out these earbud things that control Office, and they don't look great, but they do stuff and they're, they're interesting and, and they, you can see the nuggets of ideas that Microsoft is trying to attack with these products. Are they perfect? No. Can they get there? Maybe. And then on the Duo and Neo side, they didn't hold back. They could have just sat on these things and they said, you know what? Screw it. We are going to try. We are going to push these things out there. We're going to put our neck out on the line. We're going to try to be creative. And I think for Microsoft, it does much more for brand value recognition when people now say, hey, you know what? Microsoft's kind of doing some crazy stuff. Let's go check it out. Even if they don't buy it, even if it's niche, niche, it's still a good thing for Microsoft. It's, it's a very interesting product. And I'm happy to see that Microsoft is once again pushing boundaries and not holding back. We've got stuff to talk about for the year ahead. And speaking of a year ahead, I said I would talk about this. So a couple, two things, obviously not covered at this event. Surface Book 3 and Surface Studio. I have heard that Surface Book 3 is not dead. It, there is another revision coming. Expect it to look very, very similar uh, to the current one. More than likely just updated um, in, in you know, the internals. Surface Studio, I think, might be the same thing. It's just going to be a refresh of the existing product line. Nothing too crazy. I had heard that they considered talking about them at this event, but there was just so much going invol involved already that, hey, you know, why... Why muck it up? Um, so just keep an eye on if you are fans of those things that they are still alive and doing well, folks. So um, a little bit different on the podcast this time. I got a, bun like, like a bunch of questions and I'm kicking that over to a separate video because this one's already a half hour long. And so we're going to do a separate Q&A trying to answer everybody's questions. You can click on the link here and uh, well, maybe it's over there. Um, you can click on that link to go watch that video where I try to answer everybody's questions in a much more concise way. And thanks for tuning in. We'll catch all of you right back here next time.